just can it, she said. And I thought, what a perfect thing to say. That's right. Lynn over at Bucket List Homestead, fellow Canadian and friend, has uh, just recently posted a video, which I will link below, about her kind of new open collaboration, I guess you could call it, uh, called Just Can It. And I'd already actually filmed most of this video because it was kind of a documentary of our crazy week. But it was about, or it is about, getting ready for the Every Bit Counts Challenge and of course tackling those freezers again. And so it was perfect for this collaboration. So stay tuned, stick with me on this as we go through the week that we've had here and look forward to some future content on this very topic. Hey guys, we are fast approaching July. Busy, busy time on the homestead, lots of food coming in, and also lots of prep for Every Bit Counts Challenge. Now, we have done the Every Bit Counts Challenge for two years now on our other channel, and I'll explain a little bit later in this video how we're going to make sure that you get to see that content. But one thing that I am discovering as I just tried to fit some stuff into the freezer is we're already right back where we were last year with the freezers full of stuff. Today, I picked up two lambs that we had butchered last week. It was 94 pounds of meat. And as you can see here, it filled my freezer. And what I am now discovering is I have a whole bunch of stuff that I don't have a place for. I have a bag full of all different store-bought fruits that we got when they were on a good deal. I still have eggplants from the garden from last year, as well as lima beans that we didn't get through. And the one thing that I've got out here is those turnips. Now, if you remember from one of my freezer challenge videos, I talked about these turnips, which I had no idea what I was going to do with, so I threw them at the bottom of the freezer. Well, now that meat is at the bottom of the freezer, sort of, it's crept almost all the way to fill the whole freezer. And I've taken these out because a viewer did recommend that I just dehydrate them and powder them. And then I can use them in soups and stews and things like that. And it'll just kind of eventually get used up. So we're going to give that a try. I'm going to get them frosted, unfrosted, defrosted. I always get that wrong. Anyways, we're going to unmelt them. <laughs> no. Anyways, we're going to melt them so that we can squeeze out any excess juice. And I'm gonna just put them in a dehydrator like that. I might chop them up a little bit in my food processor, but we're gonna get them so that they can be powdered, which uh, will be interesting to see how we use that. But let's take a look at some of this other stuff that's in the freezer and we're gonna get that out and we're gonna start making some stuff this week because I've got to get space in the freezer. That is one thing that I do find is when the garden is producing, but not quite fully producing everything that I need to make a batch of something, I just bung it in the freezer. So the freezer space right now is crucial in order to preserve those harvests until I can get all the ingredients gathered out of the garden. So we're going to be making a few things. We have corn that I bought for Fiesta corn relish because we do not grow sweet corn. And that is something that I am completely out of on the shelves. As you can see here on the shelf, there is nothing left in this spot. Another thing that we have nothing left in is our chili meat. And that is something that I really want to get going. And since I have all this lamb meat that we just got, we're going to get all the rest of our ground from previous sheep out of the freezer. And we're going to get that into jars. And that should free up a pretty good amount of space. But we're also at the same time putting milk into the freezer from the sheep so that we can make some cheese later. I did make some feta. I'll just show you a little clip of it here. It turned out amazing. So this video is going to take place all this week as we get some stuff done. Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention is I went strawberry picking. Picked a whole bunch of strawberries. They're now sitting in the fridge, but we need to flash freeze those and get them into the freezer to be able to use in smoothies and things later. And I'm also gonna probably make some strawberry sauce. So it's gonna be a busy week. Stay tuned, stick with me, and let's see if we can get some stuff done. Well, I didn't intentionally wear a red shirt to match the raspberries, but as you can see, raspberry season is fast approaching as well now our harvest today not much we're just going to eat this as a fresh food kind of for now as a treat but as you can see behind me and as i scan over this patch there's a lot of raspberries to come and as you just saw freezer space is limited so we're going to have to come up with some creative ways to use this raspberry jam is a definite must and i'm almost out from last year as well as the raspberry syrup so we're going to take these in we're going to enjoy them but We'll be back at this patch a little bit later this year. So as I try and hold the camera steady, <laughs> look at our crazy leaning whirly 
clothesline. We really need to do something about that. But as you can see, I just finished on those raspberries and Chris is back here picking our red currants. So looks like freezer space is definitely essential this time of year. So I'll have to come back because unfortunately with the red currants, they don't all ripen at the same time. But I've really only picked off one bush and I probably have like three times out here. But we'll be back in the next couple of days, which is good. This is a lot more than last year and we only have two red currants. So as I mentioned upstairs, Fiesta corn relish, that's something you can see here on the shelf. There is none. And it's something that we use a lot, especially in the summer when I'm making potato salads and egg salads and all sorts of good stuff like that. So that is something we're going to do. And I know I said I was going to do it this week, but we're already halfway through the week and I haven't gotten to it yet. So I imagine that's going to be a to come, but I am going to do that as its own recipe video because I've had a lot of people ask me about that one. But one thing we are definitely getting to tomorrow is... Chili meat, we have none. And as you saw, we just got a whole bunch of lamb meat and a lot of that was ground. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna get out all the old ground meat that is in the freezer down here. You've seen this freezer before and you're gonna see it again, but we're going to be making up chili meat with everything that's left so that we can put all the fresh stuff down here in the milk crate that now houses the old meat. So as much as my cat loves hanging out on the freezer, I am going to kick her off because this is the freezer that houses our meat. Off you go. <laughs> and you can see on top here, all that fruit that I couldn't fit in the freezer upstairs with all the new meat has gotten thrown in here. And this freezer is not supposed to have fruit at all. So I do want to get back on track with organizing these, but first we're going to get the meat out and get the new meat in. So here you can see we've got the uh, milk crate full of meat. I'm estimating we're probably gonna have about 12 pounds, but we're gonna see if we can get it out of here relatively easy. Ooh. And look at it, it didn't all collapse. So it looks more like about 17 pounds, but luckily we are doing lamb burgers on Friday for a group of people. So I'm going to take out some meat from this to use in those as well, because I don't want to make 16 pounds of chili meat right now. All right, guys, it is time to kick it into gear on this video. Honestly, we're halfway through the week and I've really achieved nothing, but you've seen the pittering and pattering that's been going on. It's actually quite funny because just as I sit here and start to hit play, I look at my shirt and go, did I wear this shirt already in this video? That's the kind of video this is. I don't really know exactly what I've achieved yet, but what we're doing today is we're going to use this meat that we took out. Many of you know, this book here, Ball Canning Preserving, is my favorite canning book. I use this, it's a go-to for so many recipes. And today we're going to make the chili meat right out of this. So I will put the recipe down below, but just so you know, this is a book that I recommend to many people. You should have it, it's a great book. Now the recipe calls for 10 pounds of meat. We're doubling the recipe, because of course that's how I work. Now. Not all packs are packed evenly, so I do have my scale out and we're going to uh, weigh them as we go and get 10 pounds in there. I may go up to the 15 pounds, but unfortunately I had to pre-measure my uh, chili powder because I am almost out in the pantry. It's crazy. So good thing there's a grocery haul coming up, so stay tuned for that. It is on the list with a whole bunch of stars beside it because <laughs> that's something that's essential around here. So we're gonna get the meat weighed. We're gonna weigh out the 10 pounds and see what we've got left. I defrosted 12 pounds and I also had put three pounds in the fridge for Friday's dinner. And I could raid that three pounds because it's only Wednesday and take out another three pounds later. So we'll see what this looks like when it gets in the pot. We may go up to tripling the batch because this is something that we use, especially in the summer. I can pull this out to make a taco salad. I can make chili. There's so many things that it's useful for on nachos. It's amazing just to sprinkle on top of nachos in the summertime. So I might just pull out those extra packs and we will just up this, but we'll see as the video goes. But that's not the only thing we're trying to achieve today. We're also going to try to make our strawberry sauce. And we'll touch on that a bit later when I show you the strawberries that have been sitting in the fridge for a week now since I picked them at the U pick, I just haven't had time to get to them. So I'm really, really hoping they're not in too bad shape. But let's get started on the meat because this is a pretty quick process. All right, so you can kind of hear it and see the steam coming. Our meat is starting to bubble away. Unfortunately, some of it was still frozen. So this is gonna take a little bit longer than I'd anticipated to really get it browned right through. Now, 
one thing that I do is I don't add anything until it's done browning. And the reason for that is I scoop off all of the lard, the grease, that sort of thing, and put it into another container to cook down to then make nice clean lard for use in cooking and things like that throughout the rest of the year. Then we'll bring you back when we scoop off the uh, grease part and see how much we got. Usually, especially on a double batch like this, I'm going to get probably at least a full pint, if not more which is wonderful because it sustains us and keeps us from having to use oils and butters and things like that throughout the rest of the year. But otherwise, this is a very simple recipe. And when we get to adding the ingredients, I'm going to tell you the amounts for a single batch, not a double batch. I'm going to tell you how much for a single batch. All right, so I have everything all chopped up and ready to go for this, but we're still waiting on that meat to be browning. So I'm going to have my quick discussion about the Every Bit Counts Challenge. I'm so looking forward to participating in it again this year. This year will be our third year participating. But on this channel right now, there is no past content. We participated in it previously as our original channel Hickory Croft Farm before we kind of branched out into different genres, I guess you'd call it. And uh, I don't want those of you that are new to the channel and haven't seen those before to miss out on that. So what my plan is in the next month, in the month of July, I'm going to put on the Every Bit Counts Challenge videos from 2022 and 2023 so that you're up to date on what we've achieved previously and what our goals are and I'm actually going to have a little bit of fun with it and I'm going to sit down and watch them with you and kind of provide a little bit of commentary because it's really interesting and the other thing I'm thinking it's going to help me with is going back and kind of making some notes on things I'd like to achieve for this year because you know sometimes you get forgetful you get all wrapped up in what's going on in the homestead and lose sight of what you're trying to achieve. Here on the homestead, our ultimate goal is to grow 75% of our food higher if we can. This year we did milk the sheep, which was fantastic. So for three months, we haven't even bought dairy and we put a whole bunch of soft cheeses and fetas and things like that away. If you want any more information on that, you can follow on our other channel, Life Raising Sheep, which is linked below in the description. But also Hickory Croft Farm is linked below in this description if you wanna see more on the gardens and that sort of thing. But I just wanted to kind of let you guys know that in the next coming weeks, we're going to be doing two videos a week that are the old Every Bit Counts Challenge, which is kind of fun just to follow along so that you can see where we've adapted and changed and what stuff is similar. Because as you go into your canning, I'm going to call it a career, you will find that you are repeatedly canning the same types of things, but there's different challenges. This year, my tomatoes are dudders. There is nothing growing in the garden. So we're going to be well into September before I even have tomatoes. So it's going to be interesting to see what we can achieve in August and still do something every day. And I'm going to have to think out of the box because it's not going to be making ketchups and pasta sauces and all those sorts of salsas because I won't have the items I need for those. So I hope I can get creative and still come up with something to put away every single day. But until then, definitely watch along as we go through last year's and the year before's Every Bit Counts Challenge videos. But for now, we're going to get back and we're going to check our meat. And hopefully it'll be ready to start uh, adding some of the seasonings after we remove that fat or lard layer. All right, so our meat is all ground off. And you can see here what I mean about the amount of uh, lard or fat and liquid that we need to now strain off of this meat. So that's our next step. The one thing that I am, Ab, you're not starving. He thinks he's starving. So the one thing I am going to do is use my little funnel. It's not a funnel, it's a strainer. And we're gonna just put that on top and kind of, that'll catch any of the meats that I pick up as I go. But we're gonna get as much of this liquid out of here as we can because I will repurpose that and use it. So it won't be wasted. All right, so here we have, it's about three quarters full. So it's probably about a liter, liter and a half maybe of that fat that we've strained off. Now I'm going to leave this, it's going to go into the fridge after it's had time to cool down and we'll come back to it tomorrow and I'll show you just how easy it is to get a nice clean lard to use for cooking purposes. And the wonderful thing is this has no seasonings or anything in it, so it is just lard. All right, so now that we've done that, our meat is drained and nice and looking kind of dry, which I like to see. We're now going to add all the rest of the ingredients. Now I'm gonna cheat and I'm just gonna read it out of my book here for you. And remember, I'm putting double, but I'm only going to say a single batch. And there's one thing we're going to visit at the end of this here. So 
starting with five pounds of ground lamb, beef, whatever you're using, I'm using lamb, two cups of chopped onions, one clove of garlic. Now this is the part that we're gonna visit later because I definitely did way more than that. Six cups of diced canned tomatoes. Now this is where it's wonderful making this this time of year because I don't have tomatoes in the garden as we've just discussed, but I don't put that full amount in right off the bat because I don't want this to be runny because sometimes I use it for on nachos or things like that. So I don't want it too runny. So odds are I'm probably only going to put the four cups in there, not six, but stay tuned as we mix this up and we will have the final amount at the end. Half a cup of chili powder. This is where I was getting a little stuck because I didn't have a lot of chili powder, but we managed to make it. I'm doing a full cup, but a half cup is for that single batch recipe. One and a half tablespoons of salt. One hot pepper, finely chopped. Now I'm using actually some canned hot pepper sauce that we made a few years ago. So this is jalapeno hot sauce and uh, it's great because we're using it up out of the pantry because it is starting to be kicking around for quite some time. I believe, yeah, it's from 2018. So like I say, this has been kicking around for six years. It's time to get it used up. And the other thing you're going to need is one teaspoon of cumin seeds. Now, this is where I find I love recipes that you can tweak and change because I don't have whole cumin seeds. I've got ground cumin, so I'm just going to kind of adjust that. I'm going to say three quarters of a teaspoon of the ground cumin. Um, so use that as you will, I guess you could say. But the one thing we're going to come back to right now and visit is the garlic. Now, right here is my chopped up garlic quote uh, for this recipe. Now, it would have only been one clove of garlic. I did five cloves of garlic for a double batch because we love garlic. We grow a lot of garlic. And to be honest, we need to use garlic up, but you'll see this looks quite green. And that is because I also chopped up some fresh garlic scapes because this time of year, we have a lot of garlic scapes. Now for people who don't know necessarily what I'm talking about when I talk about garlic scapes, that is the part that you cut off of your garlic from the garden to prevent it from going to flower or to seed. And here you can see, I've got a whole bucket of them here. They're just a nice little fresh green. We chop these and fry them up like asparagus or something like that. They're very, very mild garlic flavor, but they're gonna be wonderful in this. And because I'm pressure canning it, I'm not worried about changing the recipe or anything like that. So I'm super excited. I probably put six or seven of these in here as well as my five cloves of garlic. So again, tweaking that recipe. That's one thing that's wonderful about this book I find is a lot of the recipes. You can really adapt them to what you and your family enjoy. So another thing that I should have mentioned was I used the one liter jar of my Italian style tomatoes, which basically is, as it implies, it's canned tomatoes with some Italian seasoning in them. And then I'm putting in a second one liter of just plain tomato juice. This is something that we make a lot of here and it's a great opportunity to use it up because the red one, we don't actually drink it as much as we probably should. We tend to drink more of our yellow tomato juice, which uh, hopefully I'll get enough tomatoes this year to share a bit about that recipe. But anyways, we're going to mix this up. The double batch does call for one more liter of tomatoes, but we're going to just wait and see as this heats up and starts to kind of simmer, whether we need to add that. And then basically it's into your jars. The one thing I love about pressure canning is you don't need to sterilize those jars in the oven first. We just make sure that they're clean, get our lids into some hot water to, uh, heat up, not boil, but just get nice and hot. And then it's gonna be into the pressure canner. One thing I will say is that I did add another half liter of the Italian style tomatoes. I'll save these for something for dinner for tonight. Uh, but it just seemed a little bit thick and I was a little concerned. So we added a little bit more. As I said, again, that is up to your preference. It's still not as much as what the recipe called for, but I don't like it to be too runny. So we're gonna get it in the jars and get it in the pressure canner. And then it's an hour and 15 minutes at 10 pounds pressure. Don't forget to oil your seal before you put it in. It just extends the life of it, which is so important. And finger tight on those jar lids. Do not over tighten because that is a common mistake when it comes to pressure canning. I'm going to get this jarred up and we'll bring it back when we're on to the next thing. All right, so our meat is still nicely ticking away at the 10 pounds pressure. We've got about 40 minutes left on it and I've cleaned up my mess. And now it's time for the next thing, which is strawberries. 
I forgot to take a little video clip of the fridge, but basically I have six liters of strawberries here. I still have eight more liters in the fridge that I've got to deal with, but what we're going to do first is can these. I had purchased this book slash got it for my birthday and I wanted to try a recipe out of there. I decided to do this one, which is a strawberry sundae sauce. I know, terrible, right? But what we mostly use this for is sweetening our yogurt or on top of Dutch baby pancakes, for example, things like that. So I kind of wanted something that was almost like crushed up, a little bit more of a syrupy sauce than just strawberries and a little tiny bit of sugar. So basically what I have in the pot here is eight pounds of cut up strawberries. So I ditched the idea of working with the liters. Essentially, this is probably about seven liters, but once I cut the ends off and everything else, it equaled about eight pounds, just a little smidgen over. So what I've done is I have put in five cups of sugar into the eight pounds. Now the recipe calls for six pounds of fruit with five cups of sugar. So I'm going a little bit less sweet than what the recipe is calling for, but I'm really hoping it'll still work and give me a nice kind of thick syrupy sauce. But we are trying to watch how much sugar we're consuming, hence why jams and jellies aren't a big priority for us to make. But because I have a lack of freezer space, I want to can these and this is a great way for us to do it for things like the yogurt and that. So hopefully this will turn out. I'm not gonna take you through too much of it. I'm just gonna make it up. And on that note, my uh, chili meat is all done and my canner, it's still locked, but it's almost down to no pressure. So we'll be able to check out and see how that turned out uh, pretty soon. I do smell the meat smell. So I'm wondering if I had a little bit of siphoning, but I won't know till I take the lid off. All right, so this video is really just becoming a glimpse into my crazy world <laughs> because the week is just flying by. So we are the next day. Actually, we're in the afternoon already. It's kind of been a whirlwind of other things going on, but I still haven't made my jam and my syrup. So we are going to come back to that this evening. But one thing I did want to touch on was our canned meat went amazing. I ended up with 13 jars that sealed beautifully. I still have to take the rings off and get them cleaned up to go into the storage, but I did have one jar that didn't seal, so that's going to be supper tonight. I think we're going to make a taco salad. But one thing I did want to show you that just splurge out of the blue, I decided to make today feta cheese. So we've been in that process as well because I had eight liters of our sheep milk that we'd been milking. Um, the girls have been producing really, really well. And if you want to see a little bit about that content, again, check out our other channel. But that is just about ready to be cubed up and dried for 24 hours. Well, guys, I said this was kind of running like a video documenting a crazy week in our lives here. But it is now 940 at night and I'm finally getting around to making that strawberry syrup and strawberry rhubarb jam. I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right, right? So our strawberries have sat in the sugar for like 40 hours now and are definitely syrupy. So instead of kind of leaving them like that, my plan is I'm going to use my immersion blender. and I'm going to just break them up a little bit. I'm hoping that'll make it a nice thicker sauce rather than runny with chunks of strawberries. So fingers crossed this works. Haven't done it this way before. This is all new. We're just experimenting together. But basically we're going to get this up to a rolling boil. We're going to boil it for 10 minutes and then we're going to jar it. My jars are in the oven. It is preheating. We're almost at 225 now and my lids are in the hot water. So it should be smooth sailing for this one. And then while it's in the water bath canner for 10 minutes, we're going to get the jam made up using the pectin so that we're ready to then transfer that into the hot um, water bath when that's all finished and said and done. So fingers crossed, I'm looking at maybe an hour, maybe, we'll see. My oven's gonna sing and I can't shut it off. So uh, we're gonna get started on this. I mentioned 10 minutes in the pressure canner. I did double check the recipe in the book. It's actually 15 minutes and it's not a pressure canner at all. It's a water bath canner. <laughs> it's almost 10 o'clock at night now. So the day is running on. All right, guys, you can hear the water bath canner is bubbling away. I apologize if it interferes with the sound at all, but we're plunging ahead. I didn't even clean my bowl. That's right, or my pot. It just had strawberries and sugar in it, so I'm sure it's fine. In here, I have one and a half pounds of strawberries and one pound of rhubarb cut up, about a quarter inch thick pieces. It says half inch, but I like my rhubarb to basically disintegrate when I make strawberry rhubarb jam. I know I'm on a diabetic thing but we don't use this very often quite often it actually goes as gifts and things like that for people and it is nice in 
yogurt, just a little tea, couple teaspoons, tablespoon, whatever, in the yogurt, and it doesn't seem to bother my blood sugars too terribly much, as long as I mix some oatmeal in there or something like that. So we're going with it. I know, terrible, right? But strawberry rhubarb jam is like one of my favorites, right along with raspberry jam, which that recipe is coming because the raspberries are pumping it out. We've been picking. The black raspberry bushes are loaded. It's wonderful. So it is definitely a berry year on the homestead. But we're going to get this jam done before it is already the next day because it's getting later. Basically what's going to happen is we're going to get this boiling, put in our, or get this heated up, put in our pectin, bring it to a boil, add our sugar, bring it to a boil again, and then jar. That's basically it. And then in the water bath canner for 10 minutes. All right. So Christopher and I have made a decision that with my health in regard or what's the word uh, with my health in consideration we are only going to use four cups of sugar not six cups of sugar so we'll see how this turns out going a bit less sugar in this recipe um, <coughs> both fruits are very flavorful so I don't think it's going to hinder the taste at all and in all fairness that was the last of my white sugar <laughs> so this is what we're going with We'll see how it goes, but I'll get it canned up and uh, we'll come back to this or maybe I'll do a community tab post to say how it turned out when we get around to trying one of these jars that we've put a little less sugar in. Yikes, it got boiling fast and then it was splattering everywhere. So I've kind of turned it down to medium, which is what you're supposed to do. Oh, as soon as I sit the pot down, it's gonna get going again. And now we're gonna add our sugar, it's supposed to be at medium heat, but we're working in a time crunch and stir that in and then we wait for it to come back to a boil and then we're going to turn it to high heat and do a rolling boil for a full minute now rolling boil means that no matter how hard you stir that foam and bubblingness of it doesn't go down so keep that in mind when you're going because sometimes it doesn't set if you don't actually do that full rolling boil so as you can see here we're not boiling right now that sugar has really slowed it down but as soon as we uh, get it going it'll be time to jar up all right so we had our rolling boil for about a minute and a half and now we are on to the jarring stage it again smells amazing i know you can't smell it but now once this is in our uh, jars into the water bath canner 10 minutes once we got them all in we'll get it to a boil and 10 minutes and then bedtime <laughs> so we ended up with seven jars in the canner and almost an eighth jar, yet I left out two cups of sugar. So I think my math may have been out since the recipe only was supposed to make seven jars, but let's give it a try. I was gonna offer Chris some. <laughs> I'm gonna just eat it all. <laughs> that is amazing and has so much flavor. I would probably make that recipe that way all the time. Not sure what I did differently that I ended up with so much, but I'll take it. Anyways, I'll come back in a moment with a wrap up for this video. But one thing I am making note of right now in this, this is the Canning Kitchen book, which we got from uh, PB Mart, used to be Tractor Supply here. And I'm going to actually write in here that I only used four cups of sugar because we absolutely love that the sugar hasn't overpowered the fruit flavor in this. So. I think I'm gonna stick with it as long as it sets. I'm happy with that. And uh, moving forward, that's gonna be my go-to. So hopefully the syrup works as well because this book had both those recipes. And I wanted to try something new since I got the book for my birthday. But wrapping this up, as you can see, we're still in full swing here, even though the every bit counts has not started yet. I'm really curious for this 2024 season for the every bit counts, what we're actually gonna to have to put away because like I mentioned, Tomatoes are way, way behind. I don't think I'm going to have tomatoes until at least September. So we'll see how that goes. But stay tuned over the next couple weeks because, like I said, we're going to go through together the Every Bit Counts Challenge videos from 2022 and 2023 so that you guys are up to date on what we've achieved from then till now. And hopefully then that'll help you guys enjoy what we do this year just a little bit more. So stay tuned for those along with some other new content because everything is kind of flourishing on the fruit front we were just talking the black raspberries are coming in the blueberries are starting the red raspberries are starting and the blackberry bushes are absolutely full outside so stay tuned for all that wonderful content that is going to be coming your way